we're sitting with millions of people who are either not counted or are considered to be employed, but they're not fully employed. Working Nation is a not-for-profit media enterprise to educate the people of our nation uh, with, as to what I believe is the most significant issue uh, we face, and that is a potential massive structural unemployment. But then the center of the bullseye of our mission is to then educate people across this country as to where the jobs of the future will be mm -hmm. and what are the mitigating strategies and solutions. And uh, I really do believe this is, you know, coming on much faster. And there's, there's clearly more understanding today than when I first started thinking about this. This started coming together in my head five and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but there's still, I'm still amazed at how little understanding there is. But also, so few people are really talking about solutions. And so the two words that are associated with working nation to the greatest degree, and it's pretty unique, is one, solutions, and two, storytelling. Mm. The slope of the curve of the change in jobs and skills when measured against time has never been so steep. Mm. And my belief is we can't wait around for conferences and white papers to educate the people of this country. And in today's digital world in particular, the power of storytelling is, you know, it's very powerful. So let's start with the problem as, as you see it. I guess where in your career did you start to be aware of the, uh, what, what you call it, the potential massive unemployment um, caused by technology? When did you become aware of that? And, and you know, why did you think it was such a, such a concern, really? Well, it was really you know, the entry into the Akamai world and then my active involvement for, in a lot of venture capital. Uh, type stuff after that. Mm -hmm. um, I really, and I, I wouldn't just, I wasn't just a passive investor. Anything I'd invest in, I would, you know, play a reasonably active role. And so I got a very good look at how fast technology was changing the world mm -hmm. that we were living in. And one of the things being jobs. And so the fact that this all came together, it's not that crazy. I was, you know, I was watching it. But the other thing, and I'll add, you know, really the third leg on the stool. So I've talked about my media experience. Mm -hmm. I've talked about my technology experience. Mm -hmm. The third leg on the stool that helped bring this all together in my head was in, 19, in 2002, Mike Milken came to me and asked me if I would invest in an online education company that he and his brother and Larry Ellison of Oracle mm -hmm. were, uh, were you know, launching. And I looked at it, and I finally said to Mike, I'll invest, but only if I can go on the board and on the executive committee, because I have no idea if I'm going to make any money, but I want to learn about this. Mm. And the reason is I was already not thinking about the idea of education and technology, because my kids were going to the finest private schools in Los Angeles, and five miles down the road, you can find a very different circumstance. And so I was, you know, due to my Akamai experience and so I said, okay, there are platforms out there that what my kids are getting exposed to, others could get exposed to via technology. So as I said, I was already thinking about it. Mike was the first, approached me with the first one. I did go on the board and on the executive committee. I was very actively involved and stayed on the board, I think about six years. I dropped off the board like the week before we filed to go public uh, because I didn't really feel like being on another public uh, company board. Um, that opened up me to a lot of uh, e education technology investing uh, over the years. So it's really those three, media, technology, mm -hmm. and education, which really came together in my head and you know, started about five and a half years ago. Uh, but I've, I've pretty much spent the bulk of all my time ever since then focused on it. So I guess the the naive question would be, well, unemployment is lower than, you know, it ever has been before, besides maybe World War II. So, you know, what's what's the problem that you see it about the, the the problem looming about unemployment, and 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 then how bad do you think that could ultimately well, first be? First of all, the numbers you're referring to are totally misleading. Okay, they're not representative at all. The workforce partici participation rate. Mm -hmm 
is at one of the lowest levels that it's ever been in. And if you're not a participant, if you haven't looked for a job within some period of time, you are not counted in the denominator. Sure. Uh, we're sitting with millions of people who are either not counted or are considered to be employed, but they're not fully employed. You know, that individual who used to work 40 hours a week uh, on some assembly line, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden that assembly line's gar gone, and now they're working 20 hours a week, you know, uh, driving Uber or whatever. Mm -hmm. They are considered employed. And so the 3.7 or 3.9, I don't know what number they're talking about now, is totally misrepresents what the re what the reality is out there today. You're concerned more around automation and, and you know, assembly line jobs, these, these kinds of, um, you know, even the jobs of drivers with, with driverless cars, you know, is, is that the what's causing that slope of that curve to be so high? There are really four variables okay. coming together at this all at the same time, like never before in history. First is globalization, okay? Globalization is good in terms of, you know, demand for product, but also you got workforce out there that uh, becomes uh, available. Second being technology. And we've talked uh, artificial intelligence and all kinds of other uh, technology. Third is longevity. Hmm. If we keep people alive longer, you're keeping units of labor in the workforce or available for the workforce for much longer. And then the fourth variable is broken education, particularly when you consider education given the other three factors that are t having such dramatic influence. And so it's those four things coming together like never before in history is what underlies, I believe, one, the slope of the curve. And the other, uh, two other things I wanna highlight in terms of what really motivates what we're doing. This time it's about the heart of America. Um, and you know, uh, yes, it's also about the bottom 20%. But this time, it's also about the heart of America. And the two examples I've used for years is the, um, the driverless vehicle. I've been using that example for probably over five years. Uh, I think driving for a living is like the number one job in 32 states in this nation. Those are middle class jobs. Right. And I don't know if it's five years or 10 years or 15 or 20 years, but those jobs are going to be disappearing. The other example I've used for a very long time, because this is an area I'm very deeply involved in, is how a marketing department of 20 will become a marketing department of two because of data and analytics. And those eight jobs disappearing are you know, excellent white collar, middle class and upper middle class jobs in New York and LA and Chicago and Delaware, throughout the country. And data and analytics is literally gonna have that type of impact on so many different, I, I believe there won't be an aspect of business, government, or the not-for-profit world that isn't driven by data and analytics. That's the bad news in terms of jobs being lost.